<laughs> what a great little video. That was so great. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I am Carrie Robb. I'm the author, events coordinator for St. Louis County Library. And I am thrilled to be hosting tonight's live virtual author interview with bestselling author and one of our favorite library guests, Lisa Scottolini. So hi, Lisa. Welcome back to St. Louis. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I, and thanks to everybody for coming. I love because it said favorite authors. And I'm like, me! <laughs> And you are one of my favorite libraries. We were talking earlier saying, I think I've been to your library more than any other in the country. You, I'm like, wow. I'm like seeing your face, man. You can't get rid of me. <laughs> this is wonderful. Well, this is going to be so much fun. Your events are always such a total blast and I expect it to be just as much fun virtually. Um, I always have such a wonderful time hanging out with you at the book events. You're just so warm and friendly. You always have a hug and smile for everyone. So we'll just give a virtual hug to everybody. Watching right. I wish I could hug you all. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to begin by thanking our wonderful partners at HEC Media, who are helping us with all of our virtual author events, as well as our indie bookstore partner, Left Bank Books, which is St. Louis's premier and oldest independent bookstore. Um, Left Bank has exclusive signed book plates that you get whenever you order a copy of Lisa's new book from them. You can order it through, there's a comment in or a Facebook link in the Facebook post that you can follow, or you can just go to left-bank.com. Also want to say that Passover and Easter are coming up. So, you know, this is a, a fabulous gift to put in somebody's Easter basket. It's a fabulous gift for anybody, any readers out there. And we really appreciate your supporting our authors and our indie bookstore partner with your book purchase. Um, so tonight's event is live, and we hope that you will join in for the conversation. You can send in questions through the Facebook comment section at any time. Lisa and I are going to chat for about 20 minutes, and then I'll start working those conversations in. So I can see them, just send them, and I will work them into our conversation. And now to introduce, I feel like you need no introduction. <laughs> You're just an enthusiastic fan base, but in case there's anyone who is a new reader watching, Lisa Scatellini is the internationally best-selling author of 33 novels. Her books include the legal thrillers in the Rosado and Associates series and acclaimed standalone thrillers like Look Again and Someone Knows. That was the book that you were with us for last time. Um, her thrillers have been awarded um, several Edgar Awards for Mystery Writers of America, every other mystery prize that's out there, I'm sure. Um, you also have a weekly column that you write with your daughter, Francesca Saratello, in the Philadelphia Inquirer, and you published several humorous essay collections. Those books have some of the best titles I've ever seen. There's <laughs> like, like why my third husband will be a dog. That's the one that I love the most, <laughs> yeah. And the meet me at an emotional baggage claim. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun, it's fun to write humor. Yeah. So today, Lisa joins us for what I think is gonna be one of the buzziest books of the summer, her first historical novel, Eternal. So I have I have my copy right here. Um, so Lisa, congrats on the publication of Eternal. This was a long time coming, right? You were working on this for like 20 years, is that no, correct? No, 20, seriously, no joke. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I got the idea for it way back in college. There was a Jurassic era and there were <laughs> brontosauruses. And I was actually an English major at Penn and I took a course with Philip Roth because amazingly Philip Roth the late Philip Ross, sadly, um, taught a course on the novel. And there were like 15 kids in the class and it was a year long course. And every, it was so amazingly, he would teach you like, um, you know, what makes this novel work and why this paragraph works. But to make a long story short, he also, he introduced me to the, our class, to the works of Primo Levi, who was an Italian chemist who um, lived in the 1930s in Rome and, well, and in Italy and was taken by the Nazis to Auschwitz, but survived and wrote an incredible memoir about it. And when I found out, started doing research, and that was kind of news to me. And then I started doing research and I sort of found this true horrific event that occurred in October, 1943 in Rome. And I said, that is a story that needs to be told someday if I ever get to be a writer, which I secretly wanted, secretly wanted to be. Um, and I've been thinking about it for 40 years. By the way, let me show you something because I brought my show and tell. This is actually a picture of Philip Roth that I took from those days. Oh, wow. Isn't that cool? Because I was the um, a yearbook photographer. And I thought, well, this is really great. I'll, I'll take a picture of him and I'm so glad I have it. You know, just to end up, you asked me one question, I'll never shut up. But I do have to say, this is a lot of love to teachers because teachers can just plant these ideas in your head 
and they change your life. I mean, I've changed everything to write this novel and it's come thanks to this teacher 40 years ago. Wow. So God bless teachers because they're so important and they teach us to read. So there's that. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a really inspiring origin story for this book. I love Isn't that. It incredible. I can't even believe I was in that class. I just so wow. You just get lucky sometimes, and I was really lucky. Yeah. So the book um, it follows three main characters over twenty years during an incredibly tumultuous period in Italy. Um, to start us off, do you want to tell us a little bit about these three characters that are at the heart of the book? Sure. I mean, it's really this sort of, I have written thrillers before and domestic thrillers and series and I've written humor. And I think this is the, like, I think I've been practicing for 30 years to write this book. No joke. It's a bigger scope. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just one family, it's three families. And it's not just the younger generation in it, but the older generation in it. And I really wanted to look at these to start with focusing on the lives of these three childhood friends who are basically born at the wrong time. They're born in the 1930s in Rome and they, it's a girl named Elisabetta who is kind of a tomboy and, but, but smart and able and loves to read. And she starts and she finds herself with two like great guy friends. And one day she starts looking at them and go, these, I think I'm getting feelings for these guys. And so one is named Marco and he's like this hunky cyclist who, who has, I wanted you to feel Rome and Italy in this novel. And I think you really do like it's, you can't go there now, but you can in the book, like it transports you. Mm -hmm. I do think that. And one of the ways it does that is that if there is an Italian word, that's the only word that will do, I used it. So there is an Italian word that applies to Marco, which is sprezzatura. And it means a, a, an effortless kind of charisma. And that's what Marco has. He's so good looking and so hunky and, you know, that all, all the girls love him. So she falls in love with him, but she also kind of falls in love with her other good friend, Sandro, who's kind of a listening ear, super smart, kind of a math prodigy. He's an Italian Jew. And he has a great expression, which is also Italian. And it's um, dimmi tutti. He will say to you, dimmi tutti, which means tell me everything. He wants you to tell him everything. How was your day? Tell me everything. And I'm like, who wouldn't want a guy like that? <laughs> I'm, I'm divorced twice. I would still be married if I, anyway. You have no idea. So she, and they fall in love with her. So it's a little bit of a no-win situation. And as they're kind of sorting out their love life, fascism is starting. And I sort of, we can talk more about that, but I really wanted to look at fascism. You know, Philip Roth had said, part of the reason he introduced us to the works of Primo Levi was that he felt that it wasn't, the 1930s and 1940s in Rome was a little bit not well known mm -hmm. and should be better known. And I felt like that. So I really wanted to bring that to life for the families and see how the changing times affected the lives of everybody there in Rome. Yeah. Well, I love how you told this massive story through these three characters. It's such a, like a very humanizing moment, especially I love that the book starts with Elizabeth looking at Sandro and Marco and just thinking like, which one do I want to kiss? <laughs> it's just such a lovely place to start. This well, you know, story. I never, I didn't know how to, you know, since I've, I, I've written novels, but I didn't know how to, I, didn't, I wasn't sure I could write historical fiction, honestly. I'd never done it before, even though I'm a huge fan of it. And I said, just, first of all, I'm insecure. So I talked to myself, I said, calm down, you can do it, all that stuff. And when I was start, I said to myself, well, the task, especially since I'd been reading and researching for like almost 40 years and was writing about a big love and a big friendship and big themes and a big war. You know, it's, a lot of my novels are, they span three days. This one spans 20 years. Mm -hmm. So it was ambitious. And, and I said to myself, well, you've still got to personalize it because you're not writing history because that's boring. And also you've got to make it move. Like I said to myself, you have to write historical fiction at the pace of a thriller. Now go. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is when I was sitting here with Elisabetta, I said, well, it's still a woman's story. And she's coming of age to a certain extent. So I thought about one of my own life when I think back. And I thought of when I got my first bra, <laughs> which now like, right? I didn't want to wear one then and I want to wear it now. But I actually gave her the experience I had, which is that she's a tomboy like me. And then the girls in the school in her class come up one day, you know, and she, they're like, you should wear a bra, you know, and the, she feels terrible and she's humiliated and they make fun of her and they call her nicknames. And she goes through the whole time, like walking through school, car carrying her, you know, 
which I feel like we've all kind of done. Yeah. But as soon as I did that, I said, okay, now I got, that's who, she's that, she's that. Mm -hmm. so you always have to make it a personal story with fleshed out, fully realized characters that are going to change over this time right. and see how, what happens next in their lives. Yeah. Well, in a lot of the publicity for the book, it's really being highlighted that this is your first historical novel um, and that it's a big departure from your previous novels. But I thought in your author's note, I thought it was so interesting that you say you have written 30 previous books that are about family law and justice. And that's what this book is about. So, how do you see this book as different or similar to your previous books? Well, aren't you nice to have read that? See, that's God <laughs> bless librarians, man. I here's the thing. I I I see it as sort of an extension. I don't see it as that different. That's what I and that's what I told myself when I was writing it. I'll tell you how it's the same and how it's different. You're always telling a story that's about people. And you try, you start to imagine them as real. You do that by knowing everything you can about the times. And also everything you can about yourself. You have to emotionally, like for Elizabeth, I'll show you another show and tell thing I have. I She wants to be a writer and she chooses the wrong time to try to be a writer because she wants to be a journalist. And that's when Mussolini is rising and he is um, making sure that all the journalists are propagandists. Mm -hmm. Then she decides she wants to be a novelist, also hard for women those days. And I went looking online for her typewriter. Oh, cool. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. Typewriter would she have owned? This is it. It's an Olivetti. It would have been there in the 1930s in Rome. Olivetti, by the way, was a, a, a Jewish family that was anti-fascist. And as soon as I saw that first, I thought it was so interesting that the keys are white. I would have gotten that fact wrong, and I'm mm -hmm. never going to get facts wrong. And the way it sounds, and I thought as soon as I did that, I sort of felt her a little like that was weird and strange, but I definitely felt it. So it was sort of the same in that it's, it has similar themes that I've dealt with. I'll tell you the way it was different, which is a really critical difference. That, And I don't want to give too much away, but when I learned about this thing that happened, which was a true event that involved real people, and I've done so much re for research for this, and one of the research things was to go to Rome, and I said, I'm going to go to Rome at the, in October when this thing happened, and it just so happened that it coincided with the 75th year anniversary of that event. Mm -hmm. So I was in Rome when there were victims of people their descendants, and I got to talk to them. Oh. And it, I know, and it was heartbreaking, but also, because I think this book is uplifting in a lot of ways, because there's a lot of stories that are heroic. Um, but I felt with this book, the gravity of their lives that were lost. Because as a lawyer, you know, I used to be a lawyer, mm -hmm. and, I, I, and I always, I have that, urge that there's justice. And I will tell you that when I started to do the research on talking to these historians, and I said, you know, given that this happened, why was there no Nuremberg about it? Because it was a war crime and it occurred in Rome and people go to Rome all the time, millions of visitors and probably don't even know about it. And he said to me, nobody wanted another Nuremberg. In other words, it was kind of like a whitewash. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, I want another Nuremberg, you know? And then I said, well, what can you do? Because the victims are gone and the perpetrators are gone, but all you can do is tell the story and it does deserve to be told. So that is how this is so different because I've written about murders before, certainly. And I've even written about war crimes before in Killer Smile, if you guys know, remember that book. But, and I've had historical elements in books, but I never had a true life event. And I just take that very seriously. I, that, is, that attention must be paid to detail in that. And I did. Yeah. Well, you mentioned being a lawyer um, and you taught an Italian Holocaust course in, or you taught about the Italian Holocaust in your justice and fiction course. Yes, I did. And, and, and the Holocaust in general. Mm -hmm. um, and that's at Penn Law School, right? Right. right. Um, and I, you can see that throughout the book that you're coming at this from a legal perspective. And there's one character, Massimo, um, who's Sandra's father, and he's kind of the lawyer for the Jewish community. Right. Um, and he's right. really trying to help people as these sort of Nazi anti-Semitic laws are coming down. Right. Um, I thought he was a fascinating character. Um, he he was, I really love him. him. What a little cutie he is. Yeah. Did you have an inspiration for that character? No, I just felt him. He's Sandra's father, and he's an intellectual guy, but he's a tax lawyer, and he's a little meek. So he... What happens is what I, when I did my studying, I realized that what happened, the long story, the short story is that when Mussolini, 
fascism very it's so fascinating fascism in the beginning first of Mussolini invented it his was the first fascist party mm -hmm. now when he started fascism it was not anti-semitic and particularly in Italy Jews were very well integrated their intermarriage rate was 50 percent the mayor of Rome was Jewish there was no anti-semitism in it and so Jews Italian Jews joined the fascist party in equal proportions to Gentiles. And that to me made it so much more poignant and such a betrayal because then what happens is at some point, Mussolini after some indecision decides to join forces with Hitler. And then fascism enacts a lot of anti-Semitic laws that affect Massimo in this story and his family. Now what happened during that time is that there was a lot of corruption so that people tried, as people tried to get out from under these laws, because they were so, the laws were just unbelievably terrible to the Jews. And so Massimo being a tax lawyer naturally knows how to look for exemptions. And I, I sort of just put that together. I said, oh, that's cool. So he will be trying to get exceptions. There were exceptions. And in a way, as horrific as it is, he finds the spotlight. Like he's forced into it and because he wants to help his community so much. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you saying that because it was really important to me that the generation of parents, you really tell the story of all of these things and the people and how they're all affected. There's not that many characters. It's easy to keep track of. Sure. But I wanted to I wanted to, people to understand that because in a lot of ways, his story is the most tragic one. And it's and it is the prototype for what happened. Right. You know, Jews from all over Europe came to Italy thinking they'd be safer there. Yeah. Uh, let me just throw this in, partly because they thought, well, St. Peter's is right there. So no one is gonna do anything bad to Jews with the Vatican right there. And also interestingly, that although we know that Rome is home to Roman Catholicism, it is also home to the oldest continuously existing Jewish community in Western civilization. And I hadn't known that. And I was like, this is too good. And it's about a 10 minute walk from St. Peter's to the so-called Jewish ghetto. So I wanted all of that in. There's so much background that I filmed it and I've been talking about it on Facebook. All those videos are up on my website, along with, by the way, an interactive map of videos I took in Rome and photographs I took there that you can actually follow along the scenes in the book. I'm Super excited about that, just to enrich people's reading experience for book clubs or whoever. Yeah, I loved, I had the ARC copy, the galley copy of the book, but then I got the, um, it's way over there, but I got the um, the actual hardcover copy and it has maps of Rome in the end. Right. Gorgeous. That's so nice of you to say that because I'll show you my other thing. So, cause I was such a stickler for um, the authenticity. Also, I kind of like to shop. And so basically I found, because I wanted it to be accurate, I found a map of Rome from 1925. And then I said to my publisher, if we get the rights to this, would you mind putting it in the front of the book? Because I think it will help people orient themselves. And it's also correct. Like it sets a tone and there it is. Mm -hmm. And just thank you for noting that because I've never had it. It's called an end paper. I've never had that before. And I think it's really cool. It's just really cool and helpful and interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how close together all these things were. Yeah. And, get that, and how that amazing that is and how that affects the story. Right. Yeah. Um, so going back to Mussolini, because I thought this was really interesting. Um, so the time period of the book is called the Ventennio. Exactly. The 20 year period marked by the rise and fall of Mussolini. Right. Um, and the fall of Mussolini is certainly a dramatic story. I mean, we've seen the photos of crazy dramatic end to that story. Right. Um, but I think Eternal kind of shifts away from the politics at that point. Um, and I think instead really focuses on the Jewish community and the neighborhood that's most affected. Mm -hmm. I thought this was such a beautiful move. I mean, we have all these horrible, you know, mass shootings and, you know, we're always saying, I don't want to hear the name of the killer. I want to hear the name of the victims. And I thought that was really beautiful in this book is at that oh. point you start saying, in this house was that family, and here are the children of those people. So those those names that you start lifting out were those real people. Yes, they really were. And that's and you're so nice. To, I never thought of it that way, but you're right. I know when I was writing, and I thought this is a personal story, and I want it to be. I want it to be their story, mm -hmm. and um, you can't take away from that. Also, this notion, you know, I got the idea a little bit when I went to the 75th anniversary because these ceremonies were very moving and they put names. And this is very interesting because these, they restored the names of the victims. Mm -hmm. And when I researched, I found the names of the victims and I put the names in the book. And 
I wanted to honor them. I wanted to tell their story. But I also thought it's so interesting because, you know, when the Nazis took them and gave them numbers, dehumanized them. And really the whole point of the book, you know, like love is eternal. That's why I think it's uplifting because even though there's hate, there is love. And the beginning epigraph is love conquers all. And, and I know that sounds kind of trite, but I think it's really true. And I think it was true then. And you see that between these friends and I don't want really to give stuff away, but they can get to each other with love and save each other with love. And that's what's such a nice, I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also a lot of stories of the heroes included in the book, you know, ordinary people who go out of their way, make sacrifices to protect people and um, right. to fight against fascism. Um, I'm assuming a lot of those people were real as well. Do you want to highlight any of those stories? Sure. I mean, there's fictional people that do that. But and in the back of the book, in thank you for reading the author's note again, because it will, I, I, whenever I finish something like that, like I just go, what was that? Did that really happen? So I said, you've got to answer that question, Lisa. And thanks again to my publisher, because I said, can I just write this? And they're sure. So I basically, you know, there was someone, for example, I came across, I don't want to give it anyway, but a guy named Monsignor O'Flaherty, who was called the Scarlet Pimpernel of the Vatican. And he basically risked his life every day to hide Jews in the Vatican. There were lots of Jews living in the Vatican walls during this time period. Uh, there's another story that is just an incredible trick that I don't want to tell you, but just a ruse thought of by a doctor to save Roman Jews. And that's really true. And it has some real resonance today. You'll see what I mean about that. Mm -hmm. And so this just, there was so much information and so, it was so dramatic and important. And I thought this is, you know, that's why this is bigger because I'm going to tell, you know, I ended up just as a quick aside, when I wrote it all out, I had like a thousand page manuscript and I said, okay, th that's pretty long. A matter is like, that's a little long. I'm like, yeah, you're right. And so Philip Roth taught me that when you get a paragraph, you know, and you're editing out, you have to go to each sentence, like justify yourself. Each sentence has to have a reason to be there. And so what I did with this book was I spread all the chapters out on the floor and then every chapter had it be there because mm -hmm. I want the pace to go fast. I don't want to bore you. Uh, I'm a thriller writer at heart. So it's going to move. And I just took out the chapters that, you know, I didn't really need. And I think you have a pretty juicy story that a lot happens in heartbreaking. It'll make you cry. It'll make you smile. You'll fall in love and you'll really feel like you were in Rome. And that's really what I wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of Rome, I mean, so the book is very much about Rome. Um, and of course, Rome is the eternal city. Um, and I thought, I felt in the book that there's just this incredibly unique sort of civic pride in Rome. Um, at one point, the character Nona says something like, all Romans live in the present and the past at the same time. Right. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with Rome and why you wanted to write about Rome and also this sort of brio that one character mentions, this kind of spirit and life of the, of the people of Rome? Well, you know, you're so right. You're, you're such a smarty. <laughs> and, you know, because you really picked that up because I really also wanted to explore time and you can explore time in Rome. And I can tell you the moment when I had that insight and I was eating this pizza, which was so good. Like I'm in Rome, just eating a, like basically a roadside pizza that I, I actually cried from how good it was. I don't know if people are watching the CNN thing with Stanley Tucci, but every time he gets this food, he goes, oh, my God. I'm like, that's how. OK. But I remember looking out at the, this vista of Rome, which is it's a, I gave this view actually to Elizabeth. It's on the first page of the book. Mm -hmm. And when you look out the tree, you know, at the top of Rome, you see like red tile roofs and you see Roman ruins and brick from the 1800s. And it reminded me of a word which is palimpsest. And that sounds kind of highfalutin, but the bottom line is this. It's so cool and so apt. In medieval times when monks would write on top of parchment, in time, they would have to write on top of it because there was only so much parchment around. It was a hide of an animal. They would wipe it away. But when you wiped it away, it wouldn't all disappear. You could see underneath what was written. And so the word palimpsest means layers of time made visible. And when I looked at that, those rooftops of Rome, I said, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing a place where the past and the present are very comfortably living together. You know, like Faulkner says, the past isn't even past. That's nowhere more true than in Rome. And then I also thought about, I just, my mind went to, when you think about layers of 
time made visible in in the flesh that's in a family that's mm -hmm. generations of a family right kid mom grandma baby and i thought the stories of rome that build rome are those family stories that's what you have to tell in this book and so it will be about time conflated but not in a bad way more like all existing in the same time and space. And that's a place that I think, you know, that's that sort of gets who Rome is. That's the secret reason why the book is called Eternal, because there's an eternity in a moment. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I, what I wanted to get to. And, 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 it's, and it's great brio, you're right to use that word. Rome at its best has a spark and so, and a life and a chaos and everyone's shouting each other and traffic this way and that. And the air is full of cigarette smoke and pizza smells and spaghetti smells and drunk people and brilliant people. And it's like that. Like I've been there several times and it's like that. But what's important dramatically is that you need to, you know, my job as a writer is to make the reader feel it. The lives of these kids, of these people and what happens to them? So, for example, let's talk about food. There's a lot of food in this book because Romans are so into it and Italians are so into it. And God knows who, everybody loves a good carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, I had in mind that quote by Dante because Dante says something like, there is no greater sorrow than to look back when you are unhappy at the time you were happy. There's something about it makes a special poignance and heartache. And so I had to show the great food at the beginning of that everybody is, they live to eat. Because what happens is as Mussolini goes on and then Italy enters the war, the food is rationed. And then as the Nazis occupy Rome, the Nazis weaponize the food against the Jewish community so that these Italians are starving. It's one of the reasons Italy surrendered. It was part of the Allies' plan. We will bomb Italy. They are the weak link. Um, they decimated the South, so where the wheat fields are, where the pasta, the flour for pasta was grown. And so that you, I can't just tell you that Italians starved. I have to show you what it's like to feel like you're starving when you used to have all the food you wanted. Mm -hmm. And so you feel that loss and that deprivation and that hardship. All of these characters undergo hardship, but they come through it. And I realized, you know, with the pandemic, I mean, it's not an exact analogy, but you don't know what hardship you will encounter in your life. And these characters undergo it and every single one of them finds a strength within them that they didn't know they had. And that's very encouraging to me because I think we are doing that now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, my next question was about, about food because the book is just delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Every chapter, there's just an incredible so nice to say that. or a dish that I was just dying to try. I mean, Alyssa Betta is that she becomes the protege for an amazing Italian cook and right, right. You know, does her own pasta restaurant towards the end. Um, was there, I mean, before people start to starve, was there an inspiration for the food and the cooking scenes that you wrote? Did you, are you a good Italian chef? No, but you know who was? I'm not bad, but my mother was the professoressa. Yeah. The character in the book is based a little on my mother because I just spent hours. And the funny thing is she never really like taught me to make homemade pasta, although I can. I just watched her do it all the time. Like, we were just hanging out in the kitchen because every she made it every Sunday. She worked, but Sundays was the day for making pots. And we always had like, um, you know, spaghetti hanging on wire hangers and wax paper around the house. Like you'd move a coat and there was like, it was crazy. <laughs> but it was also kind of great. You know, we do a whole thing for book clubs and they'll see that on the website, but give me a second to tell them about it. Because if your book club reads this book, send us your picture like we always do, because we're going to bring the book club to you this year. And I'll be doing Zooms with book clubs. Everybody will get a video, everybody, no matter what, uh, of sort of the stuff that we would do in the book club party. And for people who aren't in a book club, your acapella, you are allowed to play too. So check it out on the website. Everybody can be in it. And I only thought of that because I also put on the website, my mother's ravioli recipe. Nice. And with her secret ingredient that I'm not going to tell you, you can see it on the website, but it was, it helped me understand that character of Nona. And, you know, cause you have to make it real. There has to be an emotional, there's literal truth in this book, but there's also emotional tr truth. And the way that Nona takes in, my mother was very loving, and the way that 
Nona takes Elizabeth to in, who's a little bit motherless, mm -hmm. but also isn't real sentimental about it. It's like she loves her, but she's a little sparing with the I love you, fuzz, warm and fuzzy stuff. And I wanted that in the character. I didn't want it to be schmaltzy. I wanted it to be truly emotional in a very authentic way. That's, I think I'm known for that. And that's what I love to do. I think yeah. I did in the journal. Definitely. Yeah, Thank I you. loved how, um, how Elizabetta and the other server in the restaurant would um, try to guess what kind of pasta she was gonna oh. make based on her mood. I love that. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. I was like, I wasn't gonna leave that in. I'm like, what are you doing? That no, was, it's fun, it's fun. <laughs> when your life is food, you play with it, you think about it, yeah. What is her mood? Cause we all sit there, you know, I don't want to give it away, but as Maria says, sort of at one point, you know, and we look at her refrigerator and we go, what am I going to make? What can I do with what I have? Mm -hmm. And isn't that a little bit like life a little bit, you know, yeah. what can I make with what can I do with just what I'm, the cards I've been dealt to a certain yeah. extent. Yeah. All right. Well, we are getting audience questions. So I think I will move to that. Um, so let's see. First off, we have Michelle who would right. like to know, how was the transition from writing thrillers to historical fiction? Well, it was it was interesting because I was such a little scaredy cat about it. And it only took me, you know, 30 years to work on my nerve. <laughs> but I think now that I've done it, I broke the seal. Mm -hmm. And I love it. So, I mean, my next book will be a domestic thriller and Rosado and Associates is gonna come back too. Cause I feel, first of all, I got a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> I have no personal life. and. Uh, I love what I do. I, I'm a count your blessings person. I feel really lucky to do this. And, you know, I see some of these names here, Clara. I mean, these are people who have, their loyalty is amazing. And they have started with me 30 books ago. And when I've gone to different genres, have stayed with me. And I, ne I my job is to, to, to deliver for them every time and, and never let them down. And I think it's important to try to write new things because you grow and your, and your readers come along with you and they do too. So I don't think, I think people who have read me before are going to love this book. Yeah. And um, I forget the question now. <laughs> Just what it was like to transition. I think you covered it. Like, I feel like I made the transition. Yeah. You, you should be able to, right? I mean, it's just, also, it's fun to write about something of world importance. I mean, that's just great. Like, if you get to do that in your life, it's your magnum opus. That's what I really think this is. Good. Good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So Linda wants to know, have you ever had any of your books made into a movie and would you want Eternal made into a movie? Um, the, I get option from a lot, actually, because they're always kind of buzzing around, which is very nice. I think it would be nice because I think it would bring people to the books. I'm a book person. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll i talk to your library anytime you'll have me and you know it because I have. And that's true of any libraries. And I'm so grateful to Left Bank here, the wonderful indie bookstore. And I've signed there, too. I love that this book, you know, is like in my little hands. I got to say a lot about, well, it's all in my control, what's written inside it. It's the story I wanted to tell exactly how I wanted to tell it. And I'm proud about that. So I would love a movie thing because I think it would bring people to the books. Mm -hmm. but I never think about, like sometimes people will say, who would you cast? I don't think about that. I never think about that. And I still won't think about that. I know what Elisabetta looks like and I described her. And I know what Marco and, and Sandro look like, and I describe them, and you will have your own image, but that's what books are magical. We have an imagination, God bless us, and we bring it to the book. Mm -hmm. And so I want you to keep that image in your mind. That's why, you know, sometimes people make fun that the backs of the characters are turned on these covers, like the, but you don't see the front okay. of the character. And I'm like, you know what, That that's good. I don't want you to know what she, I don't want you to imagine this. I wrote it for you to imagine. That's my job. If I can't do it, I should get fired. Yeah. It's true. Uh, um, okay, so Joan would like to know, how do you write daily, question mark, um, certain times of the day, and then what advice would you give someone who wants to write a novel? I would really, I feel, is that Joan McKinney? I feel like I know her. Maybe just because she's been a reader for so long. But um, my advice is simple. It's Nike. Just do it. <laughs> I am telling you, I know that sounds silly, but I, even with the historical fiction, perfect case in point, I sat there, oh, can you do it? Can you do it? And secretly I was all worried because the story of what happened in Rome is so sensational and so important and also so dramatic that I was like, someone's going to tell this story and you're going to kick yourself in the butt that you didn't do it. And so I really think that 
I don't have a special rate tra training in writing. I think the best training in writing is reading and trying to write. And, you know, they say writing is a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. I have a lot of dumb sayings like that. I say them to myself. Uh, another saying I have is get it down, then get it good. I made that one up. Mm -hmm. I have one. I also referred to what uh, Anne Lamott said in Bird by Bird. She says, give yourself permission to write a, excuse my profanity, a shitty first draft. Um, yeah, because you can't, you know, Philip Roth even said in an interview, he didn't say it to me, I read it. He said, you know, when you're writing, don't judge it. You can't judge it and write it. And that's really true. You've got to write it. And this is my last quote, um, which is write drunk, edit sober. <laughs> now, not literally, but Hemingway said that. And the idea is just do it. Get out the story. Tell yourself the story. I don't know how my stories end. I don't even know how they middle. I don't know a damn thing about them, except I started this book with a young girl in 1930s Rome is going to fall in love with her two best friends and they're going to fall in love with her. Now go. Mm -hmm. And you get through the whole book just trying to figure out what would happen next. It's not easy. And there'll be times when you think I can't do this, but try to write with a quota. I do 2000 words a day, no matter what, seven days a week. And that's how you write a book. Yeah. It ain't rocket science. Yeah. Well, Cheryl had a similar question. She said she finished the book last night. Great. All in capital letters. Oh, um, nice. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> and she wants to know how hard was it to change points of views for each chapter? And I had a question about that, too. Did you write like all of Elizabeth's together and then write Sandro and then write Marco? Or did you and then shuffle them? Or how did, did you write it linear? No, I wrote it linear because... Uh, there's some change of viewpoints. I think you can keep track of it. it. You know, I think it's easy to follow because their three friends are always interacting with each other. And then at some point it opens out to their families and mm -hmm. you start to understand. Um, it, I, I, because I don't know what's going to happen next. And what, and also what's really important, like you're trying to write a page turner, even though it's historical fiction, because what the, the secret ingredient to a page turner, I'm happy to share it isn't that things blow up or things happen fast. It's that you understand the narrative logic of what characters are doing. And that to a certain extent has to build on each other. You know, like for example, the first chapter, I'm not giving anything away because it's on the website. Elizabeth is wondering, who am I going to kiss? I think my first kiss will be with Marco. He's so cute. Look at him on the bike. He's super adorable and all the girls love him. And while she's thinking that, Sandro kisses her. She's like, <laughs> what? Now, okay, now the next chapter is Marco's chapter. He's riding home from his bicycle. Now, it, what happens in the next chapter depends on what happened in the previous chapter, or it's not a story. It's just people in their own, these all relate to each other. This book is essentially about relationships, and they don't change, they're eternal. So that he's thinking, why, Marco's riding home on the bike going, why can't I get Elizabeth to notice me? Like, and was she kissing Marco? Because they look kind of close. And I'm trying to make her jealous. And then the next chapter, Sandra going is, oh, my God, I kissed Elizabeth. I don't know where that came from. So it builds on each other. It is linear. And I just try to put myself in the mind of these characters and to a certain extent channel them and go, okay, now you're him. How does he feel? Uh, and you just try to use your imagination. The greatest builder of imagination is reading. Mm -hmm. I think readers really develop empathy and being able to put yourself in the shoes of someone else, just like they say in To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, when Atticus says to, to Jem, you, you just have to walk in someone else's shoes. Well, I spend all my time walking in the shoes of these characters. So it has become second nature for me to try to imagine them, just like I can do Mary Denunzio in a minute or any of the characters that I love. They're just real for me. Yeah. Which might mean I'm crazy. <laughs> Um, well, I have one more question specifically about Marco. Um, the, so Marco is is so severely dyslexic that he's illiterate, um, which I thought was just a really interesting character trait. Um, despite this dyslexia, he's able to rise pretty high, high, high up in the fascist party. I don't that's not I don't think that's giving anything away. Um, right. But um, so why did you choose to to have that character trait, but then also make him quite successful despite it? Well, I thought it was interesting because he has so much comes to him so easily. Mm -hmm. and it all comes to him. He's gorgeous. He's fun. He's smart. And he's magnetic. But when I started to think about dyslexia, and I've done some work here with Pen the Pennsylvania Dyslexic Society, I thought, 
what is it like to be dyslexic in 1930s Rome when they don't really know? So I had to do all that research and the society did help me and I asked around, and did my homework. And it's sad, and to a certain extent this happens still sometimes today, but you know, it also worked well because Elisabetta is such so in love with books and Sandro loves books too. And they have that. And Marco can't compete on that. He has his secret and it makes him ashamed. And so he, and he developed strategies as my research told me, you know, dyslexics then to hide, you know, he, when he's pretending to read in front of the class, which is paralyzing for him, he makes his eyes move like he observes and he always volunteers. So he won't get called on and caught unawares. His strategy. Now what happens, why that matters in the book is that his self-esteem is low. And he has this secret kind of shame so that when fascism comes along, so I wanted to explore why had a Mussolini get these people following him? And it wasn't really that he made the trains run on time. That's very simplistic. It, there's a number of things. There's two real things. One is that he said to Italians, you are special. There's, there's an ultra nationalism. We are Rome. We conquered the world at one point. And they did. So that Marco starts to kind of succumbs to that message. He feels bad about himself and stupid, but, but my, Mussolini and the party say to him, you're smart just because you're born here. And he goes, I'm a son of Lazio. The other reason fascism succeeds is that it's violent and it suppresses dissent and it beats you up if you won't like it. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you're not allowed to talk if you don't like it. And you get turned into authorities and you disappear and you're murdered with impunity. So that's the kind of stuff. But it was important that Marco have that deficiency and have that secret. Yeah. And that's the reason. You had, it's a super productive question. I don't mind telling it. I don't think it gives anything away. Yeah. No, I thought that was a really great way to 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 work that character. I thought it was just really masterfully done. So well, thank you. You're very kind. The modern reader will recognize it as dyslexia, mm -hmm. but there he was clueless, as were the teachers. You know, he was trying to trick them too. Right. Yeah. So, Okay, so back to the questions. Um, yeah. Marissa, um, oh, I, I wonder if you know this person. Um, considering how deep your writing experience is and how you removed non-essential chapters from Eternal, how vital was the role of your editor, Mark Tavani, in shaping Eternal? Well, she's, this, is, this is a great reader, Marissa, who's also a bookseller <laughs> and reads so much. So she, it's a really, I'm just so lucky in her and all my readers. Um, I forget the question. Uh, how vital, how vital was the role of your editor, Mark Tavani? He, really, he was really vital. And he's the one who sort of said, you know, when I handed the big, long manuscript, big, big ass manuscript, you know, he said, you know, I really think the story should begin on page three. He called me late one night, which is not something like people do. And, you know, it's a business relationship, even though he's a very charming and lovely guy and a lovely family guy. He's just a great guy. And he called me like at 10 o'clock at night. I'm like at 10 o'clock at night. I'm like, you know, I'm scratching my butt. I'm like watching TV. And it's on my editor. I'm like, ah. And he said, I just finished reading this. I love it. It says all this nice stuff. But he said, I do think the book needs to begin on page 371. I was like, 371. Wow. And he, you know, like, I'm just going to be real with you now. I, uh, I've been in this business for a while. I've been writing for a long time. I write like eight memoirs of humor. I, I think I'm good at horrible to say, but I think I'm kind of good at this now. <laughs> and I don't get edited a lot. So like, I haven't got an edit like that since the beginning. I'm like, well, what am I doing? And then as soon as he said it and he explained it, and that night I had the book taken apart by the next morning. I was like, he is right. Hmm. Um, and it was really wonderful because that's what a great editor does. They go, there is a great story in there, but you kind of buried it. And let's get it out. And so I was, I am very, I thanked him in the, in the novel. I'm very grateful to him at Putnam. He's, a, he's just terrific. Yeah, good. Um, well, Joan, this is this leads to another one of my questions. Um, Joan wants to know where your dogs are. <laughs> <laughs> my dogs are in the bedroom, all five in the bedroom right now. The, we, you know, because they were so bad the first signing that they embarrassed mommy and I couldn't do anything about it. I had to go like, yeah, everything's great. And you're burk, 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 but I couldn't get up. And I, I'm so, yeah. I'm trying to be profesh, trying to impress you guys with my uh -huh. whole new book of historical fiction. You know, my culmination, I can't have these dogs embarrassing me. Yeah. Well, I think the the nature of the virtual event, um, that happens. <laughs> Yeah, I have a coon hound who's been kicked out of the house for the night because she howls at fire trucks. So coon hounds bark a lot, don't yeah. they? I think yeah. they bark. 
I know a, a, a like it's a red tick coon hound barks. Yes, like have. Oh my god! A red tick coon hound. Because I like I'm a dog person. I know about dogs. That dog's supposedly I think it's like 37 times a minute, which is almost every second. Yeah. Yeah. Howls too. If you so loud. Anyway, that's totally <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but it does lead me to another one of my questions. So there are two cats in the book that I right. want to ask about. Right. So Elizabeth has two cats that become characters. Um, Joe and Gnocchi. Um, so why was it important for you to include these furry friends? Right. Well, I have two cats too, although, you know, I did I, they wanted to horn their way in, but I changed it up. I wrote fiction. Um, I think it were important to Elisabetta because Elisabetta is a little lonely and, and she's on her own. She's acapella and kind of, to be real, I'm acapella. And I've been divorced for a long time. My daughter has grown up and moved away, which is what she's supposed to do. And I should mention Francesca Saratella. Yeah. Her first book this year, a debut novel, Ghost of Harvard, is wonderful. I'm so proud of her. Um, and I think that you can get love in your life however you get love in your life. So that if you find yourself single or alone or widowed or whatever, or you just, it's great to have, share your life and give love in your life. There's, it's a wonderful thing and it's sustaining. So my dogs and my cats are, I love them. And Elizabetta need, needs that. And she dotes on, and she, the, the cats to her are just her family. And she has a hard time understanding when other people don't feel that way. You know, at some point she's like, someone's offering, I'm not gonna give it away, but someone's offering her a free apartment and she, a free apartment and she's, broke and mm -hmm. basically homeless. And she's like, well, I won't go. Cause I, and they're like, well, put your cat on the street. She's I would never do that. Like I would never do that. Mm -hmm. And that says everything about who she is as yeah. a character. Yeah. Definitely. So everything is, there's a reason for it and you're pointing it out and you're genius. And that's really, um, <laughs> I was the reader, but that's the reason. Good, good. All right. Well, I think Karen, I'm going to turn the last question over to viewer Karen, cause she's got my favorite, but my question, my favorite question to wrap up with. So what book is currently on your bedside table? I am in historical fiction binge, partly because I've always loved it. And partly because when I got into this genre, I started writing to all these authors who I've, I don't know them. I don't want you to think like I'm all connected. I like wrote to them and I said, listen, would you read my book? And if you like it, I would love it if you'd say something nice and we'll put it on the back cover, which we did. Like, look at all these wonderful authors on here. And so that's who I'm reading now. I mean, they all now, so now what's happening, we've all become like virtual buds. And so I have on my night table, the books I've just finished, which is Chris Bajail, and I have advanced copies. So, yeah. because they sent them, I'm like, this is great. So um, I've really loved Chris Bajalian's Hour of the Witch, which is out next month. Um, I love Sunflower Sisters, which is out next week by Martha Hole Kelly, who wrote Lilac Girls. Lisa Wingate is one of my favorite authors. I've all loved her since before we were yours, because I love stories like that. And, um, oh God, Paula McLean, who wrote The Paris Wife, is now writing suspense fiction. So she w went that way. And her new novel that's coming out is called uh, When the Stars Go Dark. And that's a really cool, like a murder mystery, but also goes into the, her psyche. Um, Christina Baker Klein is terrific. I love The Exiles. Um, who am I forgetting? Sandra Brown is great. Adriana Trigiani is one of my favorite authors of all time. She's been writing historical fiction for a long time. And it's always fun. And it's always kind of got a lot of Italian flavor, which I love. So my, my, I just, uh, I find myself, I must say, reading more than I ever did with this pandemic. Yeah. Um, for a while, I watched everything on Netflix. And I was like, you know, I think you've actually seen everything on Netflix. And also, I was like, you know, I want to, I want to curate my life a little more. Mm -hmm. I want to... And I find I love reading. I've always loved reading. I love audiobooks too. Uh, the audiobook of this book is out of this world. I'm saying that and I can brag about it because it's not my performance. I always listen to audiobooks and I've never, I'm just telling you, I've never listened to my own audiobooks before because I'm like, well, I kind of not sure I want to hear the performance and I know what I want it to sound like. But this time I did because I'm so obsessed with this book. And I also chose these audiobook readers. And one is Cassandra Campbell, who's terrific, who read Crawdads. And also the other is Eduardo Bellarini. And he is sensational. He read The Beautiful Ruins. And mm. to, he 
hear them tell this story. And I walk the dogs every day for two miles and I just get this story and it doesn't feel like I wrote it because the performance is its own thing. As I'm sure if there were a movie or a TV show, it would be, it's, it has a life that is not the life you gave it. And so uh, I really recommend it. I think it's just sensational, just sensational. I'm actually reading the book and listening to it, which I'm telling you is not about ego. It's just, I want to like see what they did. Yeah. I want to see their interpretation of these characters. So do they have one actor read each voice, each of the main characters or is it? No, they have um, Cassandra being a woman reads, reads Elisabetta. And when she's in the Elisabetta, there's a guy's voice come on. She does it because they can do that. And Eduardo Bellarini does both Sandro and Marco, differentiates them by voice and does all the, the you know, male voices and also Elizabeth's voice in their chapters. Mm -hmm. Really a feat, they're actors. Mm -hmm. I know this because in the humorous books like, you know, Meet Me at Emotional Baggage Claim, my which I write with Francesca, she and I read our own parts because I was like, well, no one's going to read me. I'm going to read me. And I like the authenticity of that, like all this great nasal voice that's so annoying in Philly. <laughs> like you can listen to that in your car. Isn't that something to think about? <laughs> I know how hard it is to do. And I wasn't acting like anybody. I just was like, you're trying to get it out and not like, you know, make weird noises and clack and all that weird stuff. But they're incredible. They're just yeah. incredible. Well, and also just so you know, we did one of these with Chris Bajalian a few months ago and he recommended oh. your book. Oh, how nice. Oh, I'm so honored. He's so wonderful. And I just was blown away by his new one. And it's just wonderful when you find these wonderful authors and it's great to be able to pass it on. It really is. I'm honored that he said that. I know he even did a video for Eternal. I'm like, what a nice thing. Let me tell you, it's nice when people you admire turn out to be really nice. Yeah. Yeah, he is. Well, I think that we are almost out of time. We've gone over time a little bit, but oh well. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. The book is just absolutely amazing. I recommend oh. it to everybody, everybody, everybody. Um, and then next year, I hope we can get you back again in person. We can do this. Well, you know, in a minute, I will. I love you guys. Carrie, thank you so much for this. It was just so run, well run. And thank you to everybody for coming. It's so, so nice to you. Do get a copy of Eternal. I think you will love it. Yeah. And I really appreciate you taking your time tonight. Yeah. And thank you, everybody. Um, again, you can get your signed copy from Left Bank Books. That's left-bank.com. And I also want to say thanks again to HEC Media. So, Lisa, take care. Hope thank everything goes well. Very well. Now free the dog, okay? <laughs> I will. Go. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.